would you mind? All right, welcome everybody um, to this uh, health session at the World Economic Forum. I am David Agus. Um, I am a professor of medicine and engineering at the University of Southern California. And today I'm privileged to lead a session which I think is asking one of the most critical questions that, you know, the title is US centric, but I think you'll see from the panel is that really is a global question that we want to address. And that is really, is healthcare a right? You know, in the United States, health and food represent about a third of the US economy. And yet, if you look at the discourse, almost none of it is about health. So the discourse at times is about healthcare finance, but it's never about health. Today in Washington, there's X bandwidth for health, and almost all of it is on healthcare finance. And I think that discourse over time has to change. One of the things that really shocked me from reading both of their works, and these are two of the great writers of our time, is it's not just the ideas, but it's who the ideas are talked to and how people perceive the ideas. So I think what I learned, and I think what we want to get out today really is different ways of approaching the same problem and how people and their backgrounds influence what they feel and what they think, and in the long run, how that can help all of us get to a solution that makes progress. With me today are literally two of my heroes, some remarkable writers who've made an impact um, on me and I think everybody else who've read their works. Atul Gawande is a uh, physician, um, a surgeon, a writer, a public health researcher. He's a professor at the Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School, as well as the uh, School of Public Health, um, and Sam Thier. Sam was, was my mentor. <laughs> uh, my father trained under Sam as a nephrologist. Oh. So the Sam Thier Professor of Surgery at Harvard Medical School. Um, his books, many of which uh, you know, include The Checklist Manifesto and Being Mortal, have made enormous impact on medicine and thinking about medicine. And he's also a writer from New Yorker. In fact, his article in The New Yorker about healthcare as a right is what really brought out the World Economic Forum to think of this session and pulling the groups together. And we have Arlie Russell Hochschild, who is a, a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, um, and who wrote a book that came out this past year called Strangers in Their Own Land, Anger and Mourning on the National Right, a finalist for the National Book Award, and really a staggering book about embedding herself in Louisiana and learning about the right, and from a, a constructive point of view, how they think and approach problems and how we are where we are in this country um, based on the thinking that's there. And so we're privileged to have both of them today. Why don't we start out um, with a tool. You wrote this piece that kind of spurred this. I'm not blaming you. <laughs> um, but give us a, a little bit of background. Where did it come from? I mean, why did you decide to do it? Um, the, the biggest impetus was we were, we've spent the last year in the United States in a battle over whether we wanted to repeal Obamacare and whether even the commitment of the idea that government should play a significant role in supporting people's ability to live long and healthy lives, is that a bedrock goal, is that not? It's, it felt like we were in two completely different worlds within the United States, but then I also do public health projects. I'd come from uh, visiting in Namibia and in India, and I began asking people there, do you think healthcare is a right? And they were in places where they weren't living like they had a right. They, were, they couldn't get access to the care that they needed. And there was, um, uh, and so I'd ask there and they'd say, I absolutely believe healthcare is a right. It was a meaningful, important thing in their lives. It was a goal that was not being met, but you could live up to. And so when I was then going from Namibia, literally from Namibia back home to Ohio, I grew up in um, uh, Athens County, Ohio. It's in Appalachia. It's the poorest county in Ohio about 30% below the poverty line. My mother is a pediatrician there. My father died, he was a surgeon there. And, um, and when I'd sit and talk to my friends, we just avoided politics. So I wanted a way in to just figure out how to talk about it, and I, I figured we could talk about it at a moral level. And so I began asking people, do you think you have a right to healthcare? And, and to put some context on it, three of the people I sat and talked to, I first started talking to my friends, and then I talked to their friends of their friends and meet other people. Three of them had been bankrupted by healthcare costs. And maybe one or two out of the couple dozen I talked to said they think healthcare is right. Even despite being bankrupted, they did not think healthcare was right. And when I probed, I said, you know, why? What they heard it to be was a demand to pay for other people's healthcare. 
pay even more for other people when I can't even afford my own. And what it made me realize is the US is a place where you can have working people who have no insurance or insurance that they can't really use with a $3,000 deductible and no money in the bank for it, and they can be bankrupted for their health care while paying taxes for poorer people to get safety net coverage, to get Medicaid coverage that's a better health plan than they could ever dream of. No co-pays, no deductibles, no premiums. And that is incredibly important. I felt like I was being, seeing something I was missing. It engenders incredible bitter feeling because it raises the question, who deserves care and who does not deserve care? Or the other better way to put it is, whose life is really valued in our system and whose life is not valued in our system. And whether it was, you know, we've got projects in uh, Namibia, in Estonia, in India, and in Ohio, um, that question, whose life is really valued and, and not, and the, the, the backlash against the safety net, because you have people who are paying for that safety net who don't feel their own life is valued in the same way. That's interesting. And so, Arlie, obviously, you went to a different part of the country, a few thousand miles away, um, in Louisiana, and a very different group of people with a different background. How would they approach that same question? Mm. Well, um, you know, I came from one bubble to another bubble uh, because uh, I got interested in how we can uh, uh, deal with the difference between them. Um, so, a uh, Berkeley you know, it's uh, geographically different. It's, uh, I felt myself in a, a media bubble, in a electronic bubble. And so the people, what I did in this project is try and bridge the two worlds. In Berkeley, California, everybody thinks healthcare is a right. And in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, nobody does. And what um, I came to realize is that that was part of a larger, uh, what we could call red state paradox, that uh, it's the states um, in the country that are the poorest, that have the most disrupted families, that have uh, the worst education, the worst medical care, the lowest life expectancy, who receive more funds across the nation uh, from uh, the federal government in aid, then they give to it in tax dollars, and they revile the federal government. So it came down to why do you hate the federal government? What's what what goes on with it? Because if you have a uh, a right to medical care, it's the government that's going to vis-a-vis which you have that right. So what I found is that actually underneath all the political rhetoric. Um, there is a deep story, uh, and it goes for those on the right and the left. What is a deep story? A deep story is what feels true about a salient uh, issue, uh, and you take facts out of the deep story, you take moral precepts out of the deep story, it's just what's left, what feels true. And you tell it, it's almost like in a dream, that the right-wing deep story is you're waiting in line um, as in a pilgrimage, facing up a hill, at the top of which is the American dream. Your feet are tired. That line hasn't moved. I talked to people who hadn't had a raise in two decades. And, um, kids not doing well. So your feet are tired. You feel like you don't begrudge anybody. Really, it's just that you deserve to move forward. And um, then, in another moment of the right-wing deep story, there seems to be somebody cutting ahead, and you think, well, what's that? Well, it would be through federally mandated affirmative action programs. It looks like blacks are being given opportunities uh, to, for jobs that have always been reserved for whites, and we're still women again, through federally mandated affirmative action, are being given uh, opportunities that have always been reserved for men. And then you see refugees, and you see, even in their mind, public sector workers. Um, uh, and uh, even in their view, um, 
they, they, they think environmentalists are putting animals a, ahead of them uh, so that the oil-soaked brown pelican, an endangered uh, Louisiana national bird, um, state bird, seems to be waddling up ahead of them. And they feel, whoa, I'm going back further. So in another moment of this deep story, there's Barack Obama waving to the line cutters. And they feel that the federal government has marginalized them and that actually what's happened to blacks could happen to them. I'm talking about blue collar whites pretty much uh, in Louisiana. So they, uh, yeah, they, they, they don't think the government is their friend, largely well, for that reason. I've, you know, your book is amazing that way and describes the story of this line of people climbing. It, it reminds me of feeling like you're in the airport security line, <laughs> in, the, in the airport boarding line. You know that there are nine zones now. You're yeah. in zone seven, <laughs> and those people are cutting ahead of you, and you yeah. want it, yeah. you, you know, you're like, how? That's not fair. I paid to be at this level. The, the thing that took me out, out of that, though, was to recognize there were moments in our world where people don't feel that way. And so liberal and conservative uh, back home where I grew up, almost nobody um, was against Medicare. Nobody was against the universal right. Right. Uh, coverage plan we have for people over age 65. But they didn't see it as being something that's like a right. They saw it as social insurance. We all pay in. We all paid a tax in. Anytime we've paid, we've paid our way in. And we all benefit. And we, and we benefit as equals. The CEO or the janitor they all get the same benefits, they're all treated the same way, and your life is treated as one of equal worth. And in a situation where there's a safety net with certain benefits here, or, you know, so the, 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 the mistake we made in America, rooted in a World War II route, is that we tied your health care to your job. Right. Where you get your health care is first and foremost tied to your job. So that means if you got the right job, you get great health care, you get the wrong job, you may have no health care. You can have neighbors who have extraordinarily different uh, um, capacity for taking care of one of the most important things in, the, in your life survival. And then, you know, we create a patchwork system around it where different people get different deals. We're all kind of paying for it, but not all benefiting equally. And so Medicare and that kind of approach of saying we all pay in, we all get back, most of the world has arrived in that place. It's the way we've arrived at when it comes to schools, when it comes to roads. We all pay in we all, and we all benefit. We don't say there's a separate lane for illegal immigrants. We, we, we all, we've all paid in. Now, the, um, uh, that central uh, idea is playing out in the politics. The components of American health reform that are universal have been extremely popular. No pre-existing condition exclusions. Uh, covering your kids up to age 26 on your plan, uh, being able to assure a certain level of cost sharing, no, uh, coverage and subsidy no matter where, what level you get to. But as soon as you start saying, well, you're mandated to buy this plan or ha have other considerations like some people will get a much better plan than others, that's where you get, you get, this, uh, you get this battle brewing. You know, uh, obviously we in our country believe in rights. We have a right to smoke, we have a right to sit all day, we have a right to be as large as we want. Does society have the obligation of paying for the healthcare ramifications of our behavior? Is somebody who smokes cutting the line to get that overhead bin storage space that I wanted? Um, as simple as that. I mean, so what would the views be on a question like that? You wanna jump in first, Arlie? All right, well. Um, it's all about overhead bin storage space. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, people I came to know uh, felt a right about uh, owning guns, for example, uh, very powerful, uh, and a right to eat as they wanted to. They resented Michelle Obama's a garden at, with organic vegetables and uh, to improve the eating of school children. Well, you know, what if they want to eat? Uh, crap, excuse me. Um, <laughs> that's their right, you know, their, their children's right and their parents' right. So real heel, heels in uh, for that. Um, but that what you don't see, uh, unless you're close up, is they're actually very generous in other areas of their life. 
if their neighbor gets sick, you know, they will be over there. They will do everything they can through the church. Uh, they do a lot for ill members. And um, so it's a question, I think, of drawing a cultural bridge cover and, in a way, crossing over an empathy wall to get to tap into their good angels and their notion of what's collective. Often they would say, oh, the problem with big government is that it takes community away. And what's community? Well, if, uh, if uh, I'm walking on the road and a guy has a car, he has to stop and pick me up and vice versa. So they almost romanticize something collective. They aren't the ultra uh, individualistic Ayn Rand figures that I went in imagining they were. Um, so if we just move back to somehow drawing a bridge between collective uh, good uh, in the private sphere and what the government can do that's collective. I'm not sure I answered your it's what, it's over not a they, luggage. They tripled the insurance rate for smokers in that county in Louisiana. Would they be upset? Should the non-smokers subsidize the smokers? I'm almost certain they would not be upset. Not upset, right? yeah. That, that, that it's not hard to uh, ratchet up the sense that um, once you're in the game of I've got nine zones, who belongs in which zone, you know, then you create 19 zones and you, and you go even farther. It, you know, I had many conversations uh, and continued with um, my friends back home about, you know, why do men have to pay for women? Uh, for reproductive coverage. It's, you know, contraception, that's elective, that's not, you know, my responsibility. Uh, and yes, you can, you can say, hey, I thought we were all born at some point or another and that we were, <laughs> we, we were all in this together. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, the, if you take the view of, you know, this year, I'm 52 years old, why do I pay for anybody to have any reproductive needs? You know, I should have a plan for me and for my needs. And insurance is the idea of, of um, socializing risk and bring it together, and then who belongs in that pool and who, who deserves to be there. The more we drive towards the idea that there are the deserving and the non-deserving, it right. creates, you know, right. are we going to pay for the smokers and non-smokers? Right. Are we going to pay for the people who, who do not exercise and who are obese? There's another way of coming to understand, and I think this is the, the way we, we need to recognize what the whole role of healthcare is. The, um, you know, the, the way the debate is driving is towards the idea that we really just need universal catastrophic coverage, that life is a, is a, a series of events in which you're generally healthy, you have a catastrophic event in your life, you get sick, you're covered, and then uh, you get back to normal and, you, and, you're, and you're covered and you go on your way. And then maybe a few years later you might have another event that needs coverage. And it's more like, you know, your house catching fire. But instead, if you watch what the course of an 80 plus year life is nowadays, it is the accumulation of health events, yeah. Yeah. a health crisis from which you never completely recover. You now are a cardiac patient, you're now a hypertension patient, you're now, a, you're now someone who has diabetes, you're now someone who has X, Y, Z. And there's a mix of genetics and life choices and your community and your, uh, your options and availability in life that add up to those, um, uh, to that mix that you're going to have, and living a long life is about having a regular source of care, and access to your needed medications, along that way. And uh, we did a study this past spring. Uh, Kate Baker, a Republican economist, and uh, and Ben Summers, a um, a liberal economist, and uh, and I was the doc, <laughs> and, uh, although Ben's a doc too. And we analyzed the last 10 years of data around healthcare coverage, and the studies around what happens when people gain health care coverage is the first thing that happens is within a year they're financially better off. Their health hasn't improved very much. A year later, they report feeling better. About a quarter no more feel they're in good to excellent health. But again, you don't measure any mortality improvement. At five years, when people have had a regular source of care and have access to the need medication, they, um, they have a 6% reduction in mortality. It seems to be an improved mortality at every step along the way. And when you piece it apart, what you find is the people who had the biggest gains were the people who had chronic disease, HIV, cardiac disease, cancer. If you have, you're in and out of coverage, your coverage co falls apart, no surprise, you don't do well with cancer or HIV or, or, or cardiac disease. 
So when you think about, okay, now am I gonna penalize people who have these conditions by saying, okay, you're not gonna get your medications anymore. Well, now we're gonna end up with fewer people who can work, you're gonna end up people who, with people who don't just die early, they're dis disabled earlier. And, and we're simply, thank goodness, uh, not just in the United States, but around the world, unwilling to leave people simply suffering in those circumstances. The event that we say, look, I wanna charge you differently uh, and make you pay for your consequence is really your entire life. Mm -hmm. And I think we are, uh, as we think of these as less transactional, less, ab less about what are we paying for this year, but as we're supporting people across a lifespan uh, with one item which includes healthcare, uh, but also education infrastructure, those all add up to better lives. Yeah, I mean, you hit it, right? I mean, the data are very clear is that if you give people basic health care, in the long term, it's economically beneficial to a society, right? They're going to work more. They're going to get less, ca you know, catastrophic diseases. It benefits. Yet those arguments are never what's put out there. I mean, the data from Affordable Care Act are real. In this short period that we had it, we actually saw, you know, more catching cancers early, more, you know, taking heart medicines, diabetes medicines, et cetera, and there's a benefit there. But yet, why don't we see the politicians, the media, the, the, the religious leaders pushing the economic arguments, which are the arguments about which section and line you're in, why aren't we seeing that more? Right. I think it has to do with uh, something Atoll uh, mentioned earlier, that uh, the idea of a right disguises uh, the contributors from the non-contributors, right? And uh, the contributors, they're the workers. Now, among the people I came to know, they, there's an almost religious belief in work, not the effect of your work, not how good you're at work, but just the fact of working mm -hmm. is, uh, is a source of enormous uh, uh, honor and importance. One woman even told me, well, they ought to pick up all the cemeteries in France, uh, the American soldiers that fell in World War I and World War II and bring them back to the US and we'd get American lawnmowers and get American workers attending those graves. I mean, that's how strong the idea of work is. But the argument that, look, if you give good health care, you get more people working, um, it, it, that's on the other side of this bridge that, that we need to uh, cross. Um, but they think the people that aren't working don't want to work and that it's moral. Work is moral. And so people that aren't working, people who are who are cutting in line uh, or way behind them uh, in line, those, those people don't deserve it. So that line of thinking is one side of it. But the other side of it is they do have a sense of commons when it comes to disability ramps. I ask them, well, how about disability ramp? You're not disabled. You don't need it. Oh, yeah, no, there should be a disability ramp. So that's good. Um, so there is that. We need to just add <laughs> more things to that vector. They're all for disability ramps, into churches especially. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a couple thoughts about this because I see it, it, it's not just in the United States, it's a global, global phenomenon. We underinvest in health. Uh, oh, wait, you've got surgeon handwriting. That is kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, two things to add with my scribbled notes and my surgeon's handwriting. <laughs> um, one is, uh, you know, for example, we've been doing work in India. We're working in uh, state of Uttar Pradesh. In, uh, in Uttar Pradesh, they have almost double the rate of uh, newborn death as, um, as in elsewhere. As we've been doing our work there, it's, you've gone through uh, three elections that we've seen changes in government during that time. Uh, we're talking about a quarter million people who are lost because uh, of death rates that are, you know, we're measuring 5% newborn death at, at or within seven days of birth, so one in 20, um, when we could be at one in 200 or even better, it is not a political issue. It is the, the, the parties come and go, and you know parties have tried to make it that, that this is our economic future, this is your children, and, and you should hold your government accountable when, when you're allowing and failing to address this level of quality disparity, and it's simply not on the agenda. And, so, and I, so you don't have people in Uttar Pradesh saying, well, that was your kid's death, not my kid's death. That's right. It's not, 
that there, there's a, there is a sense of um, government ultimately not being the force that can create that change. So some of it might be that you don't think the government can solve it. Um, some of it might be that really other issues are much more salient, like jobs um, and so on. And the, and the investments you make here and having kids that are healthier and so on will pay off in jobs, but it's much further down the road. It's not on the political time frame. Uh, the second thing, though, is that uh, once a benefit is in place, removing it will get you in huge political trouble. Right. So, you know, you go after the NHS in England, you go after Medicare in the United States, you go after mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the hospitals that do, uh, that are in existence in India, mm -hmm. you have tremendous impact. So th there's an experiment Jim Kim is doing at the World Bank that I, that I think is a potential game changer, which is baking into the loan interest rates that countries get for their sovereign debt, that um, the human capital. So you know if you have, uh, for example, stunting, which is at 30% in India, it's at 38% in Rwanda, wow. uh, that that leads to poorer brain development, and you're taking 30% yeah. of your population offline from the future GDP growth of the country. Mm -hmm. So Jim Kim is now creating a human capital index that um, with the World Bank now starting to calculate, I don't think they've implemented yet, but he's saying they will, starting to calculate that you will pay a higher interest rate on your sovereign debt unless you address this. Wow. In which case you could make, you know, a quarter uh, billion dollars on your next loan and uh, by investing in this space. So I think wow. putting the connection together mm -hmm. so that investing now and benefit now for the sake of this long-term uh, connection, I think that may be some of the most powerful and important. But at what ways level would we do it in the U.S.? We do the local level, the state level, the federal level. Yes. How would we do that? So yeah, I mean, I think you would arguably start to bake in that if you have a community that has better investment in its infrastructure, in its education, in its healthcare, and you know the connectors, how much this pays off in the future productivity of that of that uh, that city economy, that state economy, that when they go for their loans or their ratings that that may be an, an avenue for driving. Because the problem is that those the long-term benefits of health pay off over a longer run, and you don't have short-term pain for not investing. It's just like we would also don't invest in bridge maintenance. We'd rather build a new bridge and let the, let the bridge fail. We, you, know, we let, you can keep a bridge going for 100 years. We let them die at 50 years and, and build a new one because you can put your name on and, and you can have much more uh, payoff now for that than the maintenance Well, the cost. time scale of a politician is four years. Right. So why would he or she put out capital today that's going to benefit the next regime? Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't benefit for, for, right. for a long time, right? Yeah. It's exactly the same thing. Unless you put those, made them pay financially now right. for, for those losses. You know, in uh, <coughs> uh, Louisiana, a very um, oil-dominated state, as you know. I wonder what would happen if you would say to Exxon and uh, Citgo and Phillips 66, actually, we're not going to give you a loan unless you uh, clean up the pollution. Because in this area, it's one of the most polluted areas in the entire world. Um, and uh, second highest death rate uh, from cancer for men. Um, and uh, it, there's something called Cancer Alley that goes from Baton Rouge to, um, <clears throat> to New Orleans and past, uh, where people can't work. There's an instance of three generations, a grandmother, a mother, and uh, her daughter, are all on respirators. So it, it, you're really cutting into human capital. These are not going to be great workers. Same argument applies. But I wonder if uh, you could connect that to uh, the terms of a loan to the companies that aren't cleaning up the environment. Now, there's certainly different scales different to do polluting. this. I mean, the Grameen Bank does it on an individual level. They're saying, you know, yeah. in order to get a loan from us, you have to be vaccinated. You have to, uh, uh, you know, take seeds and grow them. You have to have a latrine toilet, et cetera. And the impact is staggering on human health. I mean, so there are ways that we can actually prevent yeah. disease wow. that are cost effective, yeah. right? There's a pill a day that if you take it every day, reduces not the incidence, but the death rate of cancer by 30%, heart disease by 22%, and stroke by 16%. And if everybody who should take it in the United States does take it over the next two decades, an extra 900,000 people are alive, and we've saved tens of billions of dollars. It's called a baby aspirin. So when you have interventions like that that are very inexpensive, mm -hmm. that actually can have a major impact on public health, how do we make it so people do that? Right. How do we make it right. so that those things are enacted 
and that we're not as you know a dr green, grimming bankish and saying, listen, we're going to take away your house unless you do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do we get people to realize a behavior today that has a long lead time to impact has mm -hmm. a benefit? Mm -hmm. You can appeal to people's uh, sense of um, uh, in two senses. One is self reliance. Okay, baby aspirin. I'm going to take care of myself. And that's a, a very important value uh, uh, for the people I came to know. The other would be uh, uh, that um, you you want to um, yeah you want to do for your family. You want to be alive for your family. You be a worker for your family. So you appeal to a more. Sort so to get modest. that normative behavior change, you need leadership. But who provides that leadership to the people of Louisiana to tell them to do that? Well, I think it would be good to go to church leaders uh, and tell them, hey, you want a healthy congregation? You want to keep them alive? How about this? Well, the, um, I think a lot about this. Uh, the, the, uh, the research center that I have is called Ariadne Labs, and it's a center for health systems innovation. We're really interested in understanding how you scale. And the first way we try to scale is by awareness and teaching. And, um, and in medicine, for example, the way you get doctors to do the right thing is, you know, you just teach them longer. Now you can't graduate and go into practice until you're at least 40 years old in medicine. We just keep on teaching more. Yeah. And what we, and what we <laughs> That's find... That's a lot of fun, by the way. It's yeah. a lot of fun. <laughs> um, and, uh, and what we find is no amount of teaching will lead to um, uh, eliminating the problem of, you know, you can teach doctors all you want to wash your hands. At the end of the day, we still have a lot of people don't wash their hands. So there's a huge variation. So then we move to, okay, we're pissed. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna sanction you. We're going to have uh, mandates. So there, you're going to have malpractice litigation or you're going to have regulation or you're going to have uh, a law passed, you know, wear your seatbelt, uh, take your aspirin, those kinds of things. And um, there's two problems. It's totally crude and in indiscriminate. There are people who shouldn't take the aspirin. It's not beneficial. But in the public health world, people argued, hey, just put the aspirin in the water. You're, you're going to save more people than you're going to hurt. Sure, you're going to kill a few people, but you're going to save a whole lot more people. And, and there's an argument for that, right? Pure utilitarian, this is what you do. Um, the, uh, the, the, the A, people don't like that. They don't want to be the one who dies because you put it in the water. Um, B, the mandates, people game them. They figure out how to work their way around them. So in general, mandates pay for performance. They do increase performance, but only marginally and at high cost. And they're not very flexible. You, you know, new, new study comes out, aspirin's not so great at this, you know, make an adjustment and you spend four day, years in the legislature debating it. The, the way people really drive it is by system, systematizing it. You bake it into being a norm of the system of uh, making it work. We're actually at work doing this in Estonia. So Estonia is 1.3 million people. They're a single payer system. They have everybody on, an, on a single electronic medical record. And they have committed to the fact that they have an unusually poor survival for men. They are one of those countries where you know, long-term survival for men is not at all kept up with the rest of the population or women in particular. Heart disease is the number one killer, so it's aspirin, statin, and hypertension control. And the main approach has been to systematize, first of all, that everybody has a primary care clinician assigned to them, that you have someone who's your fallback primary care clinician, uh, which meant incentivizing the specialists to become primary care physicians, and 50% have now switched from specialty care to primary care. Second is having a, um, a nurse or a community health worker who then tracks these three things how many people are on their aspirin, how many people are on their blood pressure meds, how many are on their, uh, ha are getting their statin and have it offered to them. After just one year and 15 sites, we've got it up to about 60% from less than 10% uh, receiving any one of these and seeing readmissions already going down and likely see payback in improved longevity. And the role of that nurse is create a relationship with people and, uh, and, and be able to say, what are your goals? And if your goal is live longer <laughs> and be able to uh, survive, uh, have a better life, then here is what you can do. And you know we will get it up to over 90, 95%. We've seen it in local places in the United States. But the average person in the United States who should be on high blood pressure control, only 40% have it recognized and under control. Statins is about the same. 
aspirin is, a, is, a, is better, but still, as you say, yeah. nowhere near hitting over 80 or 90%. So before we turn over questions to the audience, I just want to ask you each one question. I mean, in one sense, you've both been hiding behind veils. I mean, you're talking about you know, Ohio, Louisiana. What's your own opinion? I mean, do you think healthcare is a right in our country or should be a right in our country? Uh, my view is yes. Uh, but I also think it's not a helpful question. So I can say, do I have a right to, um, uh, to my physical security? Absolutely, do not kill me. Now, that does not answer <laughs> how many policemen am I willing to pay for? How big of a court system am I willing to pay for? How many you know, patrols do you have going around? It, it, uh, we, we, we talk about a right as if it answers all the questions. And, mm -hmm. and it's just, it's not even the beginning of a question. It's, it's like, What's your feeling about how important it is? It's like, yeah, it's very, very important. Mm -hmm. And now, all the questions still remain open. Mm. That's a good point. I do believe, uh, of course, that um, healthcare is right, but I also agree with that, told that, uh, that the rights discourse has deeper things behind it that we uh, need to focus on. And uh, for me, the real issue is uh, getting people to think that it's good to have a common good, that, that we share a lot. <laughs> I think we've divided into two uh, very different sides that don't feel um, that we share a lot. And the people who, th who resent those who are cutting in line don't feel that uh, they have anything in common the people who are cutting in line. And that goes to a premise that uh, we're all, it's dog eat dog world, we, we don't share a lot. So I uh, care a lot about that. I wanna also add one thing. Uh, Atul was talking about men in Estonia who uh, have a lower uh, um, life expectancy than women, and, and that made me think about the genders. Actually, one solution to this, I think, is to appeal to women who, in my experience... To get rid of men, that would be... A <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> to keep them alive. Um, but they have, uh, it, you know, it, this doesn't show up in polling that there are enormous differences between men and women, but in uh, attitudes toward health care, but I think, um, or welfare, but I saw it all the time because um, women uh, are more likely to be caregivers. They're in the health system more than men are, and they're, they're recipients of health care. They live longer, and so they're at the other end. And uh, so I think the appeal might start with them and spread. I mean, listen, that's what the Grooming Bank did, and they were very successful with that focus. Yeah. All right, questions from the audience um, about this enormously important broad topic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Not a question, but a comment. I was just really struck by a common theme between the discussion, which is how do we help people change? How do we get people to engage right. in health behaviors? And I feel like there's a real opportunity for behavioral scientists, psychological scientists, mm -hmm. to inform the conversation that what we know is that we have to tap into each individual's, sh their values, and they have to own them. They have to own the goal because we can't say, aspirin's good for you. Don't you want to take an aspirin? Mm -hmm. We have to really come at the conversation in a different way so that, so that we provide the information, but then patients say, oh, I could live longer and I want to do that. And mm -hmm. so we really have to come at it from a different direction where we're engaging them in owning the goal. Right. So that was just my broad thought. That's a great point. I mean, in today's yeah, world where I, technology can personalize messages, yeah. I mean, we have the ability based on each of these many subcultures in our country and every country to personalize many messages and we're not taking advantage of it. Right, I, and I would um, uh, say I completely agree with what you're saying. And I think what that means is we need more face-to-face, -face, unmediated contact, and that in that contact, we need to kind of say, I'm interested in your experience uh, with, let's say, aspirins or uh, anything else, and I hear what's bothering you. 
You know, if you've got a grievance, if this is your deep story, okay, I hear it. And then say, okay, now let's talk. And often if you go back to what was good in the old days, that's, <laughs> you know, well, you know, there were fewer processed foods in the old days. You know, it was carrots and turnips and <laughs> um, apples from the tree, and that's the old days. They'll hear that. Old days, good days, you know. So there, you find the avenues through that kind of contact. I think it's key. I mean, listening is it. You know, we all, I'm sure, get a lot of aggressive, negative emails. Every single one I try to answer, when you answer, people's shoulders go down. You paid attention and you listened, and the next email almost uniformly isn't aggressive and isn't negative. It's pretty wild. I, I would love to also chime in to say, I think there's something really fundamental that you're getting at, which I've found to be really important in my last book, Being Mortal, which is um, about the role of healthcare. Um, in the 1950s, 1960s, the role of people in healthcare was a paternalist role that um, we know what the best goal is for you. We may not even tell you your diagnosis if you have a terrible diagnosis. We're gonna, we're gonna give you, you know, if there's three options, we're gonna make the choice about what you have and, and just trust us and you're in good hands and you'll be fine. Um, the, we rejected that in the 70s and 80s because we didn't always agree with the choices that doctors and nurses and hospitals made on our behalf. Um, and we wanted autonomy, and we graduated into a world where really healthcare is regarded itself as almost like a retail enterprise. You tell me what you want. Do you want an MRI? Do you want, mm -hmm. do you want, the, do you want the red pill or the blue pill? And then you know, we'll give you what you want. But when you know, you're in cancer, I'm in cancer, when you talk to people about uh, here's your situation, here's the tough situation, here are your choices uh, given the facts of where you are, option A, option B, option C, here are the risks, the benefits, the pros, the cons. Now what do you want? The most common answer I get, probably the same as you get, is, well, what would you do? Yeah. And then the answer you are really taught in med school to give back is, look, there's no wrong answer here. Mm -hmm. It's really just whatever you want, and we'll follow through on that. It's not for me to say. And people really feel abandoned in that moment. And what you're getting at is, the, is this role of being the counselor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and healthcare's critical role is, um, understanding what are your long-term goals in your life, given that you don't get to live forever. So besides just living longer, what do you want to be alive for? What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you not willing to sacrifice? What's the minimum quality of life you find acceptable? What are the trade-offs you're willing to make and not willing to make? And then I can make a recommendation based on experience and knowledge and so on to help meet that goal. That can be as simple as, you know, uh, do you want to eat that half pound of, st of steak <laughs> mm -hmm. um, to do you want to take that aspirin? You know, it, it varies a bit on what really matters in your life. If it's the joy of just eating a good meal um, and you're not thinking you want to put a refrigerator lock on your door, um, mm -hmm. you know, then there are other people who, who like, I love that meal, but I'm really striving for something. I want to be healthier. I have things that I really want to stay. I want to feel better. You have to tune according to people's goals. And I think People want a system that does not make them feel that they are uh, just being told what to do, but that's in line with what their goals are. And goals, goals do vary from person to person. Mm -hmm. But it takes conversation to get to those goals and value systems. Right, right. right. An ongoing conversation because right. people's goals change. Mm -hmm. Yes, a couple over here. Oh, go ahead. Oh. Mm -hmm. My name is Anjara Jackson. I'm a physician from the United States, and clearly everything that you've all said just now, especially about individuals sort of taking personal responsibility, it's so important that we get in individuals and communities to buy in. One of the problems, though, is sort of this delayed gratification because we're talking about long-term goals. People want to see some sort of immediate result. I mean, even when people are sick, they don't always follow what they need to do to get well. So one of the questions that I have for you um, in terms of just healthcare overall in the United States, you were mentioning this program in Estonia. Smaller country, more homogenous. How do we translate that to this huge, multicultural, multiple diverse, how do we get people to really buy in and start to make changes that are truly gonna make a difference? So uh, I'll, I'll give my two cents on it yeah. and see where you guys drive, jump in. Um, I think this is a dramatic shift from 30 or 40 years ago. The 1940s, 1950s, when we created insurance, 
Healthcare was about rescue. I'm gonna give you penicillin to rescue you from your pneumonia. We have these new operations. We can give you dialysis to rescue you from dying from end-stage renal disease. We didn't have data though. And then you had the Framingham Heart Study in the 60s and 70s that started telling us, hey, people who control their blood pressure have a better outcome. People who, have, who don't smoke have a, have a better outcome. And then we, um, and we started recognizing if you do certain things now, it pays off a couple of years from now. Now we know things based on genetics, based on your profile, based on your community, where you can take actions now that will matter 20, 25, 30 years in the future. That's really hard for us. As human beings, we don't function in that kind of a way. And it's a negotiation and it's a part of making that more visible to people and trying to turn that into daily habits and goals now. I don't think we should pretend that any of us are good at that. Um, but one thing we know is that people who are in a regular source of care um, around their primary health needs, regular source of care for the majority of their needs, including prevention and projecting in the future, um, with data around what matters in your life, and get, then getting your needed medications, do remarkably better. So despite our fragmented system, despite all the battles we've had, we are in a situation in the United States where we have um, uh, the people who have regular sources of care, their longevity is improving. So even though we've had stagnating longevity in this, the, in this sector of the high school educated only male part of our um, community, those are the people who have become most disconnected from the rest of society. And so the ways in which we are tying people back into community, giving them some basic public supports like uh, a regular source of healthcare, I think is a crucial way forward. And we see that in many other parts of the world as well, that economies improve and being able to engage in economies drive survival upward, but then it's are you engaged in and part of uh, a primary health uh, core as your care? I'd say that um, I'm not sure that um, an incapacity to delay gratification goes to, to the source of the problem as I saw it. Uh, they can delay gratification. In fact, the people I came to know were really stoical, you know, and took pride in putting uh, their job first or their family first. Um, they were capable of, a, a, you know, not just drinking beer and smoking. They were, they were capable of it. But at the same time, they also got their back up when it came to the right to smoke or the right, you know, to eat unhealthy stuff. And uh, there is an apron that I saw a bunch of times that said, if the, if the cook ain't fat, I ain't eating it. <laughs> In other words, you know, that's not your delayed gratification apron, but. Um, but there's some truth in it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a conflict they were in. I think you hit an enormously important point. And, you know, it's the lack of a feedback loop, is when you do something, you get something back. And the problem is, is that in medicine, no matter how we try, we can do population health, but it's very hard to do individual preventive health. And so when I don't know necessarily a marker for health, and I can't measure it, how do you optimize on a parameter when you don't know what that parameter is? So I do think putting resources to actually develop health indices so we can have an individual feedback loop, which is something that we as a country, as a society, as a world need to do, and we're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You could just throw it. <laughs> I think you were talking about, when you're talking about delayed gratification, it's sort of a question of incentives. Is there a question of decent incentives here? So you know that you can drive 100 miles an hour on Ohio Turnpike, you will get a ticket, right? So is, is there a way, it, you know, it's a naive question, but can you say if you don't exercise, your taxes will be higher? I'm just throwing random examples, but I is there a way to attack this question from the disincentive side, not just from the incentive side? I think this partly goes to what I was saying before, that when we try to regulate and control through incentives, they're very crude and not terribly effective. What we know is that you know, punishments are more effective than carrots, so sticks are more powerful than carrots. And so yeah, if um, uh, you punish people for doing the wrong thing or punish them for the right thing, 
you shape behavior in certain ways. Um, much more powerful is simply systematizing things, building in certain defaults. You know, you, for example, building in defaults that require you to walk um, in order to get to the Congress Center from, <laughs> from your hotel because the shuttles don't work very well. Um, the, the, uh, the, you know, getting- We're supposed to keep this positive. All right. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, blue zones are these communities that have cropped up in the U.S. and now starting to be elsewhere are ones where you're building in the defaults, for example, that the kids walk to school um, as a regular part of, you know, a walking school bus for kids who live within a mile of the school where, you know, groups of kids will be escorted by an adult to, to get to school, that people are building in half an hour of walking in the workplace and standing and uh, other kinds of ways of doing it. So you can approach it through the punishment route, but we found that you just don't get that far. But um, uh, systematizing it so it is the default of the community that we're going to have, uh, you know, we, we're doing it more and more in the schools. You don't have the, the fried food, you don't have the, the, the sugar, sugar drinks uh, and people are building in better eating habits and, and we're seeing ways that's paying off. And then in the way we structure communities and structure work um, and it's actually no more costly than trying to create the whole enforcement mechanism and the police are gonna you know, go after the, those problems. I, I would uh, second that. Um, if, if we were to create that, disincentive, the people that I came to know, because the Trump base, would say, um, oh, the regulatory state, you know, is uh, bearing down on us, and well, these days you can't send your kid to, out to the playground without putting a helmet on and knee pads so they can go down the kiddie slide and, you know, the nanny state. So one runs into that, that belief system. <laughs> yes, you have to, related to the goals that she was talking about earlier, the community has to agree on those goals. You know, we could, we did, you know, we now have 65 and 70 and 75 mile an hour speed limits in different parts of the world because we have all agreed that, um, you know, we'll take a few, th we'll take a few hundred more deaths over having to have 45 mile an hour speed limits or 30, you know, we could have even yeah. fewer if we all drove at 25. So those are legitimate societal goals to, to trade off in certain ways. As we get toward the end, let's take one more question, and then I want to summarize um, where we are. Is that? It just occurred to me. Maybe there's a, maybe we should also frame this not only as a right that you're entitled to, but that there's responsibilities that go with that, which you've been talking about, but haven't really articulated that as something that goes kind of hand in hand with a right. Just like we have a right to vote, and there might be certain responsibilities that go with that, as far as education or something to understand the system. Just putting that out there and how do you, yeah. how do you articulate that responsibility without threatening people that you're being, invoking a nanny state or creating any negative connotations. But I think people like that pair up. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we've done it. We have mandatory childhood vaccines yeah. that we mandate. I mean, yeah. we could do other mandatory health things on the preventive side. Yeah. I mean, we don't mandate mandate getting an HPV vaccine. Yet we can eliminate 40,000 deaths a year if we did it with almost no downside. Yeah. But, w you know, there, there's a reticence to actually pushing things, unfortunately, okay. in this country. When I asked people about why they like Medicare, it was because they saw it as much as a duty as a set of rights, right? That, mm -hmm. that we all followed our duty of paying in while we were working. We all paid our Medicare tax, and then we earned the right to have the coverage back. And that sense of, um, in many ways, what does it mean to contribute and to serve your duty equally is the, is the key question. So, you know, in Medicare, because everybody, if you've worked even a quarter in your entire life, uh, you have paid in some Medicare tax. Mm -hmm. And if you've worked for a, f a tiny fraction of your life, that has made you eligible. And everybody, you know, the people I was talking to, they, they understand perfectly well. Some people are paying in a lot more and other people are, are paying in less. That, but there's a general sense that that was a fair, equitable way that everybody has contributed and served their duty of making a contribution. Um, if it, you know, there are certain payment schemes where people feel like it's way out of whack and some people aren't paying anything at all and then that's not fair. And so that sense of duty comes in. I, I, I almost think that that's why I feel like the rights discussion gets us off in the wrong direction. It's really 
what are the duties that we're all going to contribute so that we're all enabling that, that, that um, this capacity is available to all, treating everybody's life, lives as being of equal worth. Equal worth in our lives means that we are all equally responsible to make a certain contribution and that we're all treated as uh, worthy of respect and dignity and having your life chances. Right. Um, I, I like this very much as part of the solution. Um, the, the people I came to know had a strong sense of duty. And what I really think we need to do in this country is do what I would call symbol stretch. We have a duty, a, you know, a duty to take care of yourself and to be healthy, um, and that is a contribution to the whole. But how do you start with, uh, how do you get someone to accept that? I think you start with what their sense of duty is, duty to their family, duty to get to work on time. They already are there. You just have to stretch the symbol and say, actually, isn't there another duty here that's a contribution? I think people could hear that. Well, I love this conversation. It gave us a different perspective, at least me it did, on the arguments um, regarding health. And if you each want to summarize in a sentence or two as we have a minute left, um, to the audience, what you've taken away from today, um, your vision for Middle East peace, your vision for ending <laughs> world hunger in one or two sentences would be great. <laughs> well, I would go back to this con uh, contributor's uh, comment that we really need to uh, find ways to um, uh, talk across these uh, uh, cultural worlds that we're now split into. And I totally agree with Atoll uh, that rights doesn't get us there. Uh, we, we maybe have to symbol stretch the very idea of a right, you know, a right to live in a healthy world. Um, so that and uh, I think that's the main thing. That's great. I'll, I'll say the thing that ties it all together for me is, the, is that I think that the debate over rights only divides us, but there are bridges in our debate. And I think the bridge is probably most closely seen around the question of whether all lives have equal worth. Um, people around the world are really inspired by that American ideal of that all are created equal. And by that we mean that all lives have equal worth and that if you come into a hospital, it doesn't matter who you are, you ought to be treated as if your life is, uh, is worth dignity, respect, and, and the same chance as anybody else. And I think that is the bridge that we can um, uh, come back to uh, and, and bring alive. That is Love a beautiful bridge. Yeah. And with that, I thank you both for participating, and I thank you as an audience for participating. Yeah.